Hi everybody, it's Camille. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the phagocytes involved in acute inflammation. We're not going to go over the entire inflammatory process right now, but I just want to remind you of uh, kind of the context here. So if you remember what's happening is there's some sort of tissue damage and resident cells in the tissue will detect this damage and start to secrete inflammatory mediators. An example would be mast cells that secrete histamine. And these inflammatory mediators do two things. Number one, they affect the blood vessels nearby, the local blood vessels. They cause vasodilation and they also cause the blood vessels to get a little bit leakier. Number two, they start to attract white blood cells to come in and, and help deal with whatever the situation is. So remember, inflammation is a part of the innate immunity. So the same essential process is happening regardless of what problem there is that caused the damage. So phagocytes in general do a number of different things. We, of course, we know that they phagocytose things, including um, bacteria, damaged cells, immune cells, etc. But they also secrete antibacterial substances. They recruit other white blood cells to the area. They present antigens and initiate the adaptive immune response. And they also help in, uh, initiate tissue repair and can dampen the inflammatory response. So these cells are very important, not just because they're phagocytes, but they, they have all these other functions as well. So we got to remember that when we're talking about them. So which cells are phagocytes? This is a list of the professional phagocytes. And of course, there are other cells that can phagocytose as well. We're not going to be talking about them today. My next question to you is, which of the ones listed here are also antigen presenting cells? And uh, it's a little bit of a trick question. So ma macrophages and dendritic cells are sort of the big guns when it comes to ant antigen presentation. However, monocytes and mast cells may also be antigen presenting cells. I'm going to take a little detour here and remind you about antigen presentation just to make sure we're all on the same page here. So remember inflammation is innate, is part of the innate immunity. However, sometimes you also need to, or actually you, you typically need to also activate the adaptive immunity to deal with whatever the specific problem is. And in order to do that, you need to present um, the antigen to the adaptive immune cells. They typically cannot um, detect this specific problem without um, some kind of presentation. So there are specific cells that are designed to do this. If you recall, the molecule that is involved with presenting the antigen is called major histocompatibility complex. There are two types of this. One type is found on all nucleated cells, so basically everything except red blood cells. <clears throat> and this just helps to say helps us to say, um, okay, this is our own cell. You can, um, if a cell has, for example, been infected by a virus, it can present um, certain peptides that will initiate um, its own death and so forth. So it's kind of, kind of checking in on how that cell is doing. <clears throat> MHC2 is the specific molecule that is involved in antigen presentation. <clears throat> in the case of antigen presenting cells, this allows the cells to present extracellular peptides. So essentially the cells will phagocytose a problem substance of some sort. They will digest it and then present a small piece of it called an epitope via this MHC2 molecule. And in that, once that happens, then cells, adaptive immune cells, can detect that it's there and mount an adaptive response. Um, and so you can start calling in specific T cells and B cells secrete antibodies to deal with the problem. All right, <clears throat> about each one of these cell types specifically so we can learn a little bit more about how they're uh, involved in inflammation. So the probably the number one type of cell you hear about in acute inflammation are the neutrophils. These are circulating in the bloodstream typically. They usually make up about uh, 50 to 60% of circulating white blood cells. And the neutrophils are basically just looking for issues. They're traveling around ready to go if there are any problems. So once uh, the inflammatory process is started, if you recall, um, those neutrophils will start to slow down. They'll start being um, marginalized. And then they will leave the blood vessel and enter the tissue. All right. 
once they get into the tissue, they become phagocytosing machines and they basically just start gobbling up any problematic substances that they come across. The, they do not tend to return to the blood, uh, bloodstream after they're done. Part of the phagocytotic process involves the lysosomes. Remember, that's the stomach of the cell. And they can't regenerate the lysosomes. Once, so once they're used up, they have reached capacity, the neutrophil isn't active anymore, and it essentially dies. So we, we used to think they're kind of um, one-trick ponies, right? They go in, they gobble something up, they die. That's great. They, they are basically the first responders. And that is true. They are very fast. They usually can get there within 30 minutes. Neutrophil um, levels in the blood will dramatically increase within an hour or two of inflammation starting, so um, that they are kind of the first responders. But it has recently been shown that they, they have other things that they're doing. One of them, which I think is really cool, is they actually release these... Um, they release these uh, what they call neutrophil extracellular traps, abbreviated NET, so NETs. And basically, they're kind of ejecting um, chromatin in this, this um, kind of mesh-like net out of the cell. It's called death by netosis. So just like we have apoptosis and necrosis, now there is netosis as well. Um, and so this, this um, netosis can do a couple things. Number one, it can actually trap um, pathogens or problematic substances, so it's acting as this um, net. But there's also some evidence that these nets can actually aggregate, so if there's a lot of neutrophils in the area that are producing these nets, um, and they can start to degrade cytokines and chemokines and thus actually lessen some of the inflammatory burden, so kind of starting to mop up um, some of the in inflammatory um, substances that are present. Um, there's also some interesting evidence that the neutrophils can actually sense the size of whatever the, um, the microbe is. And so when there's a large microbe, for example, um, Candida albicans is a very large one, they will undergo this um, kind of netosis process. But when they're small, um, microbes that can be more eagle, easily phagocytose, they don't do it. So it's really interesting. Um, there's a, potentially a lot more to neutrophils than we had initially thought. All right, and here's just a picture. Um, this is a bronchiole, and uh, it's been infected with Candida albicans. And you can see here, this is a um, this is the yeast, and this is the hyphae. And if you look, this is, um, when we go over here to this picture, it's a blown up of this square right here. And this is the net that's basically engulfing uh, the fungus. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting, right, that there's this whole other capacity of neutrophils that we haven't um, haven't been aware of prior. So let, now let's talk about monocytes. Monocytes are another type of circulating white blood cell. And... Um, you know they tend to they tend to be thought of as precursors for macrophages. You'll see them talked about in the same breath. Um, but it turns out that monocytes in and of themselves actually do have some um, kind of immune properties. And interestingly, there's actually a debate about even how we define monocytes. So uh, many immunologists feel that a monocyte refers to the circulating form of this white blood cell and that once it leaves the blood and enters the tissue that it becomes um, either a macrophage or in some cases a dendritic cell. So um, I just want to throw that out there. There is some evidence that monocytes before, um, before they exit can potentially be antigen presentation cells. But in general, their their primary role is that they're they're circulating in the tissue in the blood. And just like neutrophils, they start they can sense uh, where inflammation is happening based on the um, chemokines that are being produced by the inflamed tissue. And they also extravasate, leave the blood and enter the tissue. When they do that, they become uh, typically macrophages. As I mentioned, there is some evidence that we do know that monocytes can also become dendritic cells, which we'll talk about later, but they're mostly uh, thought of as kind of precursor cells to macrophages. Now, what is the difference here with a macrophage is another type of phagocyte that arrives at the inflamed site. 
And uh, usually it will take about 12 hours from the time the monocyte leaves the blood until it turns into a macrophage um, and, and starts to kind of do its, do its phagocytosing job. However, I want to point this out to you. Not all macrophages have to start out as monocytes. There are macrophages that are resident that just live in the tissue. So stem cells can produce macrophages and they can also reproduce by division. So you can, there's a multiple sources of macrophages in the tissue. Um, almost all tissues have resident macrophages. Sometimes they have different names. For example, cup for cells in the liver um, or a type of macrophage, longer Hans cells in the um, in the skin. These do not, macrophages do not circulate in the blood and uh, often they can live for months if they are not activated. They will become activated when they're exposed to inflammatory scenarios and there's a bunch of different things that can activate them including T-cells, cytokines like tumor necrosis factor, um, and also pathogen derived compounds, for example, um, lipopolysaccharides from bacteria and so forth. Once they are activated, these macrophages are um, sort of the ultimate phagocyte. They are very, very efficient at what they do, and uh, it just takes them a while to gear up. So basically the neutrophils are coming in to hold, hold down the fort for a little while until the macrophages can really get up and running, and they are what's really going to um, be the most effect effective when it comes to this phagocytotic process. Now, they're not just doing phagocytosis, they're also releasing things like nitric oxide, reactive oxygen species, um, interleukins, and other inflammatory markers, which do a couple things. One, they can help um, recruit other types of immune cells, but two, they can actually recruit lymphocytes um, and activate um, helper T cells, which can then stimulate um, B cells and stimulate the adaptive response. Um, macrophages are antigen presenting cells, so they can also um, they can also be involved in that aspect of adaptive immunity. There is also some evidence that certain types of macrophages, especially the resident ones, can um, turn off inflammation, can help um, calm down inflammation as well. Um, macrophages can regenerate their lysosomes unlike, um, unlike the neutrophils, so they also last a lot longer. They can, they can keep going where the neutrophils have a, a more limited lifespan. All right, let's talk dendritic cells. Isn't this a beautiful picture? This is an artistic rendition uh, from the NIH of dendritic cells. But um, dendritic cells are cells that are typically reside in near the edges of the body, so um, where the, where the um, tissues interface with the outside world is where you're going to find a lot of dendritic cells. Um, and they are phagocytes, but they're also extremely good antigen-presenting cells. These are, while, while um, macrophages are kind of like the ultimate phagocytosing cells, dendritic cells are the ultimate antigen-presenting cells. And they are, um, they're very adept at activating T cells, and they, especially naive T cells. They can play a role in tolerance, and they can also interact with B cells in terms of um, playing a role in immunological memory. So here's here's the key thing about these. First of all, we told I rem you remember I told you that some monocytes can become dendritic cells once they enter the tissue. There are also dendritic cells that are derived separately. Okay, so again, they're they come they're coming from different places. Um, but one of the key aspects of dendritic cells is that they're mobile. Once they enter the tissue and they undergo phagocytosis, they can actually travel through the lymphatic vessels to the lymph nodes, as I've displayed here, and there they are going to actually seek out, they're going to they basically find the T cells living in the lymph nodes and present the antigens to them there. So while macrophages can do, uh, present antigens, they can only present them really to whatever lymphocytes are coming to the site of inflammation, whereas dendritic cells are, are actually taking the antigens and bringing them to the T cells where the concentration of T cells is the highest. So that's a, um, a really key distinction there. Lastly, I want to talk about mast cells. 
which are very exciting, right? So mast cells, again, we, we typically think of mast cells when we're thinking about allergic responses and you know histamine responses, IgE responses, and things like that. But it turns out here, um, this is a beautiful chart from this Urban Shepherd paper, um, but it turns out that they actually have a lot, many more roles in the immune system. So you can see that certainly they are phagocytes, um, and they will phagocytose problem substances, degranulate, and contribute to that inflammatory process. Um, but they are also involved in uh, cre increasing blood vessel permeability. Um, potentially, they have this interesting, um, interesting role of potentially helping with expulsion of parasites from smooth muscle via smooth muscles. Um, they can increase mucus production, which of course helps in the um, in the fight against pathogens. And um, they're also going to call in other types of immune cells in addition to. Um, in addition to working with some of the cells in the adaptive immunity to make that go more um, effectively. So uh, this is this is pretty interesting. Um, they're pretty interesting cells and there's a lot more to them. So actually this, this paper down here is an open access paper. You can read it for free and I highly encourage you to check it out if you happen to have a particular interest in mast cells and their role in inflammation. All right, so I hope that that gives you some overview of the types of phagocytes that are involved in acute inflammation and uh, helps you contextualize the information a little bit. All right, let me know if you have any questions.